Morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to kick off our webcast now. I am really excited about this. I think we have a phenomenal story here. Uh, dare I say one that has uh, exciting tales of high sea adventures. Um, sorry, that was the best joke I could come up with. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the crux of the story today, we're gonna be talking about how Princess Cruises is using uh, Lingotech and Drupal uh, to really empower an application that allows for onboard interactions with uh, their customers. And uh, without further ado, I, I really wanna get kicked off uh, before we do that, I have just a couple of um, housekeeping items. Uh, if you're listening from your computer, um, select the mic and speaker audio option. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the majority of questions we'll go ahead and take uh, via the Q&A system. Um, please remain muted if you, if you are a panelist and you're participating until you're actually speaking. That'll help uh, keep down the external noise. Um, I would love for you to ask those questions in the chat window, and I will pass those on to the panelists as we go along. And if at any time you want to tweet something in this webcast, please uh, do tweet with the, uh, the handle at Drupal Association, and we'll make sure that that gets uh, published back out. Uh, one more little uh, announcement. Uh, we do have an upcoming DrupalCon. We just finished one, and it's time to start planning the next one. Uh, in late September, we're going to be going to Dublin, and so I wanted to remind everybody of that. Also, we uh, frequently throughout the year have global training days, and I wanted to call out that the next global training day, I believe, is September 9th, and that will, will be uh, the next big event that uh, you can kind of get involved in with the Drupal community and the Drupal Association. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, so we're going to be talking through the, the Princess at Sea application and uh, onboard surveys that uh, you participated in. Our presenters today, we have Hilary Neef, who's the, the project lead from Princess Cruises, uh, Nate Craddock, who's also a project lead at Princess Cruises, uh, Sabu Hura, oh, I apologize, I should have got the <laughs> yeah, I had him. My apologies, Sabu. It's okay. And also, uh, <laughs> Calvin from uh, Lingo, uh, VP of Marketing from Lingotech. So let's go ahead and uh, kick this off. So. Just in short, could uh, someone give us that, that high-level view of what this project was about and uh, what made it so successful? You want to mm -hmm. go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, Prince of the Sea is uh, kind of a guest experience portal on board our ships. It's um, we'll go into a little bit more detail, uh, at least from a uh, I guess detail from a high level kind of a contradiction, but. Uh, at least give a little insight into what what it actually is um, through some screenshots and a little bit, but but really it's um, a you know way for each of our individual vessels um, to have kind of their own uh, web based experience. Um, it is a portal that allows our passengers and our guests to um, view the, you know their on demand bill, view all the events that are happening on board, to um, see menus and dining and venues and ship deck plans and, um, you know, all available on the ship uh, via the Wi-Fi. Um, Drupal runs on each one of our vessels right now, so we've got 17 different Drupals floating around the world, um, all maintained by the ship as well as um, um, being uh, having content fed from a, a centralized shoreside repository that, that uh, both pushes content out to each one of the vessels as well as uh, brings content back in. You'll see some of that workflow later. We'll kind of go into um, one of the more interesting use cases we have with that content workflow um, um, that in particular, uh, you know, deals with multiple, multiple languages and automatic translations and human translations and all this kind of stuff. Stuff that we couldn't have done without Drupal and without Lingotech. I mean, that flow might make it even more visual and clear. Yeah. And it sounds very complex now. It might get better. Yeah, yeah. And in particular, we'll be talking about kind of the onboard evaluation survey that we use. It's really, um, you know, kind of expanded what we can do with this platform on board and and the way that we can get feedback from our guests. This sounds really exciting. I, I'm I'm excited to dig into this a bit more. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit. How how did uh, how did you connect? How did Lingotech get involved in this uh, project? Um, and uh, Calvin, maybe a little bit about uh, Lingotech's kind of role in kicking this off. Uh, we cannot hear you, Calvin. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Sorry about that. 
I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity here to speak. Um, Lingo Tech and Princess Cruises have been uh, working on the Princess at Seas application for a couple of years now, and we're excited to uh, be a partner with them. And the new survey uh, application as part of that is the newest project um, that these folks are doing. Uh, what's exciting is, is they've been able to you know, use the same platform um, and, and having that sit on site of Drupal and use it for a, a variety of different functions and applications on each of their ships. And so as uh, I'll let uh, Nate and Sabu and Hillary talk a little bit more, but it was really important for them to be able to uh, service their multilingual clientele and, and, and have the customer service aspect be serviced on board those ships. And so it naturally fit that they needed to have translation as part of the capabilities of their uh, of their solution, and uh, we had met, I think, at um, a, a bad camp several years ago, and made the introduction and, and started, you know, working on some prototypes early on. And it's it's really the these guys' um, vision that made this come true. Uh, we're just the, the translation piece of that, uh, but we're excited because it's such an interesting case study. Um, and as you'll see, as we start to go through some of the slides. Um, how they've actually solved this problem, I think it's probably, if not the most unique solution, it's one of the most unique Drupal solutions um, out there. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to those, those folks and let them describe that. But uh, we were excited to be a part of the project and certainly, uh, you know, the community aspect and being at some of the camps and, and cons has helped uh, us, you know, be uh, part of the community and, and make these kinds of connections. Excellent. Oh. So, uh, going to the next slide. Uh, thanks, Calvin, for the uh, introduction and uh, uh, relationship with uh, Lingotech. It's been very, very valuable for Princess at Sea team to work with Lingotech. Uh, it's been a great partnership, and uh, there's more to come in the future. Uh, going to this one is our team from uh, DrupalCon New Orleans from last week. Um, so, Hillary is part of the presentation, I think that she's having some technical issues and she's not able to join. So uh, should we move forward to the next slide? I apologize, dude. The slides are a little complicated. So <laughs> I hope we, you know, so. <laughs> um, so, you know, just a brief introduction to Princess. Um, we were founded in uh, 1965. We just had our, um, our, um, 50th anniversary last year it was a full year-long thing. Um, we uh, had 18 cruise ships up until March. We retired one of them, so we have 17 currently, and another in construction in Montalcone, Italy. So uh, we'll be back up to 18 uh, mid or around mid next year. Uh, we host over 1.7 million guests each year across all our fleet and all our vessels, um, and a lot of people know us from The Love Boat, which was a very popular show. It ran for like a decade. Um, uh, we celebrated that as part of our 50th anniversary last year, actually. Um, we had the cast out on one of the ships during the, during the naming ceremony of Regal Princess. Um, a lot of fun. And kind of ties in with The Love Boat a little bit. Our last deployment was actually on the namesake of The Love Boat, which was the Pacific Princess. Um, uh, so kind of give you an idea of the scale of uh, what a ship is like, um, you know, it's kind of hard to get a picture of it. Even, you know, seeing this photo, um, it looks big, but some kind of facts about the actual uh, construction of these ships. Um, if you could page forward a little bit, there's a bunch of little um, stuff here. So like a vessel like this takes, you know, about 3 million man hours to construct. It's built out of uh, 37,000 tons of steel. Uh, within it, it has about 2,500 miles of electrical cable, um, you know, land cables, all the infrastructure to make, you know, not only the regular plugs and all that stuff work, but all the IT equipment work. Um, and to make it that, you know, clean uh, look, it took about 95,000 gallons of paint to paint the entire ship. And um, uh, there's a 14 ton and anchor in the front. You can kind of see it in the front of this uh, uh, the ship here right under the princess, um, regal princess name right there. It's that big kind of slot in the side. Um, to give you some ideas about uh, what our operation looks like um, from 
uh, you know, the entire fleet per month. We go through almost, you know, a little over uh, 14 million slices of pizza. It's a lot of pizza. Uh, about a million and a half gallons of soda pop. Um, one million cookies we serve on board. It's my favorite thing. It's kind of uh, Me too. very bad. <laughs> 120,000 bananas, which I always find interesting when you compare the amount of bananas to cookies. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, and enough ice cream to fill an Olympic-sized pool. So uh, it's, it's a lot of stuff, you know. We, that's some we amazing serve. logistics there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, to me, one of the most fascinating things about this business. It's just, in, in order to make someone's vacation happen, you know, what, what, uh, what goes into that, really, uh, in the background. So, Princess at Sea, like I said, it's a Drupal-based application that lives on board the ship. So there is a web server on the ship serving up Drupal. Um, it's D7 based right now. Um, we uh, hook into a bunch of different backend systems um, as well as have our own content publishing. So we show like all the events that are happening on board, uh, which also includes allowing our guests to create their own personal events that they can share amongst their circle of friends on board. Um, we include, um, I think there's one, yeah, there we go, the uh, access to their stateroom account, which uh, ties into our property management system on board, a uh, free messaging system uh, so that uh, guests can communicate with each other. And a very important part of this is the multilingual interface. We started out two years ago on Sapphire Princess when we first started operating uh, in China and Japan. We um, offered it in uh, simplified Chinese on one ship, um, rolled it out then in Japanese and Chinese on two other ships, and have recently rolled all our languages out across the entire fleet. So we currently have Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, and English. We'll be adding German in about a month and a half, uh, adding traditional Chinese mm -hmm. in um, August, and then rolling about three or four other languages out next year. So a couple of things to note here is, uh, one thing I would like to remind is um, running the Drupal is running in each ship, and the challenge that we have is providing the right information to the passenger at the right ship at the right time, which is a disconnected environment. It's not uh, the satellite connection is not very strong at times, so Drupal has to independently work on board the ship, as well as uh, it should be smart enough to provide the information even in a disconnected state to the passenger. Uh, so and the, and the ships travel through time zones. One interesting factor that um, we had to solve is normally when you think about a server, it stays at one place. Our server moves around the world and moves through time zones. So it's an interesting problem that we had to uh, solve at these things. So if we go back a couple of slides, uh, we actually missed. Yeah. So and that's one other piece we kind of talked about briefly is that. You know, Drupal is on the ship. It drives not only our application on the mobile and on um, tablets and desktops. We also have web services available that our video on demand system uses. We drive um, kiosks for like the art gallery um, directly and indirectly. Um, we talk to uh, some of the equipment on the bridge so that we know, you know, what the latitude longitude of the ship is, all sorts of different data, as well as a uh, future project, which is um, driving the actual printed version of the ship's daily newsletter um, from the content that we have. Um, so all and this runs- little finance as well. Yeah. Oh, hi, hey, Hillary. <laughs> hey. Glad you could make it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I love it. So Drupal is, is truly your, your create once, publish everywhere uh, hub for exactly. everything you're doing on the ships. And that too in a disconnected environment with replication uh, of data. Uh, irrespective, if you think about it, we provide information in multiple languages, but we may not have trans translators on board for all the like six, seven languages that we'll be su supplying. So we had to have the corporate branded information to the passengers with the flexibility of changing schedules and changing um, events and everything to provide a system which is flexible enough to uh, give uh, the passengers the right information. So excellent. Um, yeah, uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, and I think if you put it once more. Well, yeah, go ahead, Hillary. 
we can go through it all. So there's so the way we have it set up is there's um, each ship is running its own instance of Drupal as well as a shore side version um, in California. And the shore side version is actually the system of record that so contains all the information um, that needs to be served out to the passengers, but also the code base has to go out to each of the ships as well. So that shore side server replicates information to all the ships um, throughout the world over a satellite connection, which is um, really limited bandwidth on our ship. And um, like I said, it serves both the passenger but also the business. So it's feeding things like the kiosk, the signage on board the ship, patter. So it's really important that um, we maintain that connection between them. Do you mind if I ask real quick, is the, is the content actually being produced at the ship level or is it being produced back home in, uh, in California and then shipped out to the... It's actually both. So oh, okay. yeah, we have some some information is created from Shoreside Corporate, and then other information is created by the um, by different crew members on board. So they're going to be entering perhaps event data, or if an event changes, if they have to skip a port, so things like that. Um, the crew members need to be updating on board the ship. Excellent. I also love this representation of Drupal taking over the world. I'm just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> we have been reusing this in for many presentations. Yeah, People we, love it. We like it too. Yeah, I like <laughs> I like seeing him floating around with the Drupalcon. Yeah. Around all uh, so tell me a little bit about how this is empowering your customer engagement. So yeah, so that I, I think it, it, yeah, it's a good transition into kind of where um, the the thing we wanted to highlight today, which is. Is kind of you know we we talk about technology and we talk about Drupal and we talk about how we deploy content and all that stuff. But you know in the end, um, you know our customer and our guests on board. That's really the important thing. You know the technology is there to enable all of that kind of stuff to to enable them to have a great vacation, um, to enable our crew members to um, to provide the information so that they to the customer at the right time so that they can make informed choices about what they want to do. Um, in their leisure time, and then also to provide that um, that good guest experience on board. So, you know, we think about all, all this stuff. You know, there were some some key things that we could improve uh, essentially. Um, so, one of the key performance metrics that the ship has is um, you know the onboard evaluation survey. It's something that is sent out um, to every guest via email at the end of the voyage. Um, it, it allows them to, you know, give pretty candid, direct feedback on how the ship operations were, what they thought of different offerings we had on board, different ports, that kind of stuff. Um, but we did have a challenge, and that really is was centered around kind of, uh, you know, our role into Asia, and that was because a lot of our guests are booking via charter companies. Um, they're really we didn't have direct access to them like we might have with somebody who's doing a direct booking with us here in North America. Um, so we had to rely on paper forms really and, and trying to um, get the guest to fill out this paper form while they were still on board or try to get it distributed through the charter company, et cetera. We didn't have email addresses to send the, this stuff out to and get them to fill it back in. Um, so you can imagine with this, this you know, benefits to this, we get a lot of data, but there's big drawbacks with paper forms. Um, and uh, you might want to move to the next slide. Um, and and the, well, one of the challenges that we have with a paper form is that we're, we're not just serving English language speakers uh, as our customers, it's, it is a worldwide operation with, you know, bases of operation in different areas of the world. You know, during the summer times, we may be in the Mediterranean, uh, focusing on a more European-centric passenger. And uh, different times of year, we will be operating in Alaska, which is mainly North American passengers. Uh, other times, we'll be focusing on, uh, you know, having certain ships in Asia. So we'll be, you know, really um, trying to give that guest experience to a native Japanese or Chinese language speaker. So, um, so, we run into a challenge there with a paper form that's English based that ha with a crew that is mainly English based um, trying to get passengers to give us that kind of feedback that we need in a meaningful manner, mm -hmm. um, which we've done. Um, and I think, um, you know, it, it is, is a, an enormous, <laughs> enormous amount of effort because, you know, you do get, 
you, you can collect paper, but you do end up collecting a lot of paper. And since it is um, a, a, an analog um, uh, thing, you know, you not only have to collect that paper, you have to code it, you have to key it into the data warehouse, then you have in order to even do some meaningful analysis of that data. Um, and one of the things we found, I think that's kind of like was the, the life cycle of one of these, uh, you know, from a guest filling out our survey, to it getting translated, to it coming back to the office, to it getting keyed into our um, warehouse, to it going back to the ship was about three weeks. And, you know, it's a tremendous amount of time um, for to, to, to be able to pivot and make, um, you know, positive impact on the guest experience. Um, we, you know, we may have, there may be an issue that's happening on board that we want to correct, but we may not know about it for almost a month, and we may have repeated that same issue over and over and over again uh, before we were able to correct it. So, so in a period where we are doing instant customer recovery and service through Twitter and other mediums, our business, even though it's heavily dependent on customer service and meaningful experience for the passenger, um, we have lost our, uh, or probably might have lost our chance to recover a customer with this entire process of taking three weeks to get information of the, how the customer sentiment was while they were doing the cruise. So this has been a major business uh, challenge, you know, to uh, give a customer service that people expect these days. So mm -hmm. that's where we had to create some uh, better creative solutions. Definitely makes so, sense. Uh, next, yeah. And that's where we thought, well, we have this dynamic digital platform on board all the ships already. How can we leverage this? That you know that has multilingual that feeds all these different uh, environments that has a connection shoreside to LingoTech that not that we use mainly for human translations, uh, but also has a powerful uh, machine translation workflow. Um, mm -hmm. You know what what can we do to leverage this? You know on the on the first step it was creating a uh, an electronic version of of this form that we could deliver that didn't require emails that didn't require paper, that allowed somebody to have, you know, more decent amount of time on board. Um, so we looked at a lot of different um, community-driven modules for this. Um, there, there's a ton of great stuff out there, unfortunately for us, for our particular use case. Um, and, and what we needed to do with this uh, form, we had to kind of, um, you know, build out something ourselves um, that could allow us to, you know, allow our Sure side um, content managers to maintain their own question bank to publish that question bank with multiple different kinds of questions sounds very similar to you know web form or those kind of things but uh, unfortunately web form had some limitations around translation and that kind of stuff that that just wasn't going to quite work for us um, but that's it's kind of key when you look at the slides so we have you know some generic stuff that is like you know checkbox kind of options, you know, have you sailed with any of these brands before? You know, we have the ability to do, you know, radio kind of uh, checkboxes to be able to rate from zero to 10, uh, which is mimics what we do with our email-based Qualtrics um, survey system um, that also allows us to dynamically generate questions. So this particular one, you know, how much did you enjoy, enjoy visit each, visiting each destination? It's basically just a generic question that looks into Prince of Sea to see what the itinerary is and then allows us to say, okay, we know we are in Tokyo, Busan, Kobe, so let's, um, let's collect the... Um, yeah, the as, as the next step is also more personalized questions like, okay, you have taken this short excursion. So what do you think about that short excursion? So it's highly dynamic how we are thinking about it. Yeah, and personalized to the customer. Yeah. So this is Gavin. So you guys are actually creating dynamic surveys based on the actual trip and content. And, and is that something you guys have to uh, go in and, and customize or does that just happen automatically? It looks like it happens automatically. but. Yeah, we do. So there is a little upfront work in you know, defining that kind of a question. But sure. yeah, once that question is defined, then um, yeah, then it just happens dynamically. Um, as um, long as that question exists in, in that particular um, um, 
uh, uh, evaluation for that particular voyage, that, uh, for that particular ship even, um, then, um, then, then it'll show up and automatically populate. Very neat. Cool. And uh, we also have open text fields where they can share more information. So irrespective of having uh, regular check boxes or radio buttons, we also have um, full feedback they can type in in their native language. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, sure thing. We also have a couple questions that are coming in. Uh, oh, one of them sure. was was asking about uh, the, the theme. Uh, did you base it on an existing theme? It looks like it's being delivered over, over web. So um, is it a headless approach, or is it uh, a more traditional uh, Drupal theme approach? So right now, it is a traditional Drupal theme approach. We are moving in the headless route. Um, we, we don't have a huge, so we're doing APIs and headless for ourselves more than anything for mm -hmm. our own sanity, but it's working perfectly fine the way it is. So we don't have like a, a huge rush or a need to drive out, um, you know, a headless uh, Drupal implementation. Um, <coughs> but we do have services going out to other platforms. If you have seen the earlier slides, we talked about uh, digital signages and uh, video on demand systems, which actually get data from our <coughs> APIs. Um, moreover, we also have some places where we use, use hybrid approach. So we use Drupal mm -hmm. to render, render the shell, and then the data inside uh, gets rendered by a uh, headless route and a, uh, and a front end rendering mechanism has been done. Uh, it also happens while we interact with other systems, mm -hmm. like our billing system on board. We don't process the data that, that's been provided, but we, it's rendered um, on the front end from the API from those systems. So it's like a hybrid approach. We use Drupal rendering. We use uh, like uh, front end the headless approach too within the Drupal shell, and we are moving towards uh, a headless route too. Makes yeah, sense. I think these particular quest these particular pages are all kind of an API driven yeah. um, form. The rest of the site uses views quite heavily. So we, we're we're a big fan of views. We're very happy when we when that's in D8 and all that kind of stuff. Excellent. So you see here, this is like, you know, another, um, this is basically the Japanese version of that same form. Um, uh, these first couple slides are, are the, the, or the first couple screens here you'll see are, are the Japanese side, and the next couple are the um, uh, simplified Chinese side. Um, and, and this um, was a key feature for us was the, you know, we, it, it's easy. <laughs> There's no translation involved when it's a zero through 10 score, uh, but it's these, these particular uh, open text fields that were the important ones to us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so right now what we're looking at is that kind of one way outbound translation workflow where um, content is generated shore side automatically uploaded into Lingotech. Uh, there's workflows in there for each language separate from Drupal. Uh, one of the things we really liked about the Lingotech implementation was, um, for us, Drupal's multilingual stuff, it makes sense. You know, entity translation, uh, string translation. I mean, well, it makes sense maybe uh, being generous. It's, it's, <laughs> it makes sense once you understand it. <laughs> but There's a little bit of a so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, we didn't. We wanted to turn this over completely to the business, so we really that was we were from the get go looking at translation management systems and in talking with Lingotech and their integration that they had already for um, Drupal, it made the most sense that we could allow people to translate content without ever having to to actually learn uh, the idiosyncrasies of Drupal's translation management side. So we wanted um, to take the translation out of Drupal. And also, we might have translators from all over the world uh, who may not know how to access the, the system or may not even have access to Drupal. Uh, so we wanted to take that content outside of Drupal, push it to Lingotech, and have a separate workflow within Lingotech. And then once the, the workflow is completed, we'll bring the data back to uh, our show set application and then gets replicated to the ship. We have some more da data on, and visuals of how it happens. Uh, but one thing before we move from this slide, um, this survey module that we have done, as Nate has mentioned, is a question bank. Uh, we had a custom create a question bank, uh, the reason being reusability. 
So mm -hmm. once a question is created, that can be used in a traditional survey like this or ad hoc surveys. So as I was saying, if the passenger has taken a specific uh, shore excursion, we can do ad hoc surveys once they're back uh, from that shore excursions or there they had a, a dining experience and you know, we can do ad hoc surveys. So it's a question bank which brings in data from different uh, touch points, different ways, and then brings it all together into one place. So the question can be reused in multiple ways. That's why we had to do something custom and we couldn't use anything that's available in the community. Um, uh, so we had to, um, and that actually works pretty well now. And I think we should go forward to how the workflow happens overall between Princess uh, at Sea and Lingotech. And over to you, Nate. So this will this will probably require lots of clicking. So I'm sorry. I apologize for all our animations we put in here. A little complex. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no worries. I, I'm sure. learning it on the fly. It's all good. It's just okay. like, you just, you just do it while you're going. <laughs> cool. So kind of like we had said, um, you know, we just really want to make this kind of clear so it's clear how the data kind of all flows, whether it be data that's being driven automatically or is it something that a person is actually inputting. So it kind of starts with the, you know, the two systems that we have here shoreside that are managing content, both our princess at sea um, that lives internally in Lingotech. Our shoreside admins will add content, in, in this case, specifically those questions into the question bank. Um, which automatically goes out to Lingotech. And there's a workflow around that where it gets translated, um, and then automatically comes back into our presidency. And at that point, it then starts populating out to the ships over our satellite uh, connection. Um, so one of the unique things about um, the way we set it up was that questions and any content really can target specific ships or multiple ships. So in this case, ship A and ship B are getting um, the, um, the, the uh, content distributed out to it. it when the uh, survey goes live, then our cruise guests can start entering in their data. So at this point, it's all one way out to the ships um, for that kind of global population usage. Um, so they'll start entering all their data and all that stuff. And now that this is where we now have to start doing the interesting stuff. You know, it's easy for us to look at a numeric value uh, when we roll this data up back shoreside, which we do. We all the survey questions come back shoreside, go into our master repository here, and and so on. Uh, but it's this one that was the tricky part. We wanted to get feedback from our guests in their own voice, um, because we may there may be specific things in there or or little bits of things in there that we might pick up on and or that you know will that will help us with service recovery um and and the experience recovery so you know the guests will enter in their um their uh um feedback right. into that form um i think there should be a animation on the guest uh, on the next slide all right yeah, you can and then and the yeah, and then, then it then it all starts replicating back via the satellite to our um, shoreside library. Now this is where we go from a human translation to a machine translation. So Lingotech automatically machine translates it, repopulates that content back into our shoreside library. It then gets fed automatically into our data warehouse, exactly like our Qualtrics um, uh, system does. And one important note there, um, everything else in this flow is JSON-based REST communication. The data warehouse in Princess C use XML because um, uh, that's what Qualtrics uses and we wanted to just leverage what that was already doing. So I just note that because it's one of the neat things about uh, you know, services in Drupal is that it's very, very easy to switch from one format to the other. You know. Um, you can have essentially both endpoints working at the same time in, in just about in, in yeah. installation, which is, is really powerful because it gives you a lot of uh, legacy compatibility if you're dealing with systems of maybe older technologies at play. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so clicking further, you have a lot of clicks in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now, so now we've got it machine translated into languages. Now the nice thing too is we've got it in Lingotech, so say there is something some something the machine may not get quite right, but it's 
a comment that we want to really look at, um, we can go back in and a human can can post translate it and then it'll update all these systems as well. So it. once it gets back shoreside, then it redistributes this machine translated content back into the ships into the original uh, questions. So uh, the 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 original language stays the same, um, but we've got the you know entity translations for all the the different stuff that particularly English that may be needed, which then gives us a pretty interesting opportunity. You know, it gets back to the ships, and then um, it, I think if you go for one more, um, uh, you know, and it takes, and that's the cool thing. So this process takes about 15 minutes, 30 minutes maybe max. It's all more dependent upon the latency and the, and the speed of the connection more than the Lingotech translation or Drupal doing anything. Um, so once it's back, so we went from three weeks now to 15 minutes of a machine translation of um, comments from the system. This is a dashboard that the uh, ship's customer service uh, directors and uh, people in that department can look at. Um, this one's got every language enabled because it just will automatically translate everything to everything else but maintain the original language. But what we're, you know, what we're really looking at is the English. You do see here it is a machine doing the translation, so it's not always going to get the translation perfect. It leverages um, uh, either Microsoft or Google uh, Translate here, um, but uses the same connection to the Lingotech system as we had before, so there really was no new work needed other than creating a new project uh, on the Lingotech side. I, I love it though that. because what you've got is that instant feedback. If something doesn't make sense, they can just request an actual manual translation and go through the process there. So you're getting the best of the both worlds. You're getting the speed of machine and then uh, a follow up with that manual to get the accuracy. That's that's really powerful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's and that's really for us like the key thing is now you know we've gone down to 15 minutes. Um, we have a, a dashboard on the server. It's it's getting into into our data warehouse faster than ever, um, so it allows now. If you go to the next slide, just to kind of you know, um, it allows our customer service people on the ship to see this stuff. If there is some kind of issue where we we are have an opportunity to elevate the guest experience, they can reach out to that particular guest directly uh, immediately rather than waiting for a comment card and you know, one of our international hosts or somebody to translate it and, you know, it just happens. Um, and then you can immediately assuage the issue with a pina colada, which is what I'm seeing in this slide. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like empowered customer service. You know, they have good information that they didn't have ever uh, to service a customer, you know, have a better experience for the customer, a better vacation uh, experience for the customer. And that's a key for, for instance, business too, enterprise, so that uh, the customers have the maximum cruise experience and the destination experience through Princess. And I think we frequently possible. hear we frequently hear the statistic that it's at least five times or more even um, costly to acquire new customers instead of retaining our existing customers. So this system definitely helps us um, fix any issues and try and keep that um, customer expectation right where it should be. Excellent. Yeah. Great story. So just to kind of wrap up, you know, definitely dramatically reduced um, survey time. I mean, there, you just can't compare um, three weeks to, to 30 minutes, you know. Um, gives us that opportunity for increased engagement. Um, it, it, I mean, that's, that to me is one of the key things. Like the, what all this technology stuff really should be doing is um, allowing more and more human interaction, you know, um, on board. That wasn't possible before. Um, and by that, you know, we can personalize that that customer service experience for our guests, and it becomes very um, like transparent that their comments are being heard, that the ship is acting on them, that they they're we want to provide the best vacation experience that they can have, uh, uh, and the best value uh, for um, their spend, you know, really. Absolutely, I mean, it's again the customer experience that you come to expect in a show site environment, you know, um, a famous story of you know, somebody getting um, a, a, a problem with their food order actually tweeted and the manager comes before the food arrived because they, they are tracking to Twitter and had a better customer service. You cannot imagine that in a ship environment somewhere, you know, somewhere on the sea 
Uh, we're trying to provide that level of customer service that you, ex you come to expect on a, a shore uh, in a, a ship cruise ship. So that is our, that's what we're trying to do. Definitely. Okay. And, you know, kind of the final thing was, uh, like Sabu had touched on earlier, it's giving us new opportunities and new ways of thinking about, you know, how we how we gather this kind of information. You know, it's paper forms work, but they are kind of dry and boring, and there's a lot of effort in order to get this out. And there's now we now have a platform where we can do a lot more interesting things um, and interesting ways of getting feedback and acting upon feedback and and increasing our transparency to our guests too. You know. Um, so. Well, one question that just came through was, uh, it, it, you know, you have the, the content going back, getting translated, coming back to the ships. Uh, does the ships have an opportunity to correct the translation there if you, if you have someone on the ship who can um, basically provide a manual translation, translation and pass it back? Or does that surely, yeah. surely happen at shoreside? Yeah, so we do uh, allow uh, our the qualified translators on board. They do have access to Lingotech on, on the ships too, so they can go in, um, correct translation. Because we do want to get it in there because um, there's a lot of stuff about a uh, translation management system. I'm sure Calvin will talk a little bit about more. Uh, but, you know, the, having that in the translation memory and a, a yeah, correct a translation thing. in there is key for the future. So when we are going to leverage that memory for other uh, translated documents that, that a correct translation exists already and can be matched up with those strings. So come. the quality of translation gets refined uh, as we go along and yeah. fix the translation because it goes back to the translation memory and then the translation gets better and better uh, over a period of time. Excellent. Well, uh, speaking of Calvin and uh, kind of getting an overview of the systems there, a uh, good segue. Um, Calvin, tell us a little bit more about how Lingotech plays into this and some of the services you offer. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I thank you, Hillary and Nate and Sabu for the, the explanation. And I have to give these uh, folks kudos. This is an absolute killer way of implementing this. And it's, you know, very creative. Um, you know, not only do they have onboard folks that can do translations, they centralize all of their content. It gets reused, repurposed, um, pushed out. And as you can see, this is happening all near real time, um, which is just uh, amazing. Um, we're really happy to be a part of this. It's been a fun journey for us um, to see, you know, they them push the limits and the bounds on this, uh, not only from just Drupal, but just in how, how you push content in general around, um, you know, to different services and servers. And um, it's just, it's really fun. But uh, just to give you a, a really brief overview of LingoTAC, um, you know, we, or the first cloud-based translation management system, um, as uh, as Nate mentioned, and translation management system really is a project management workflow tool that allows you to translate content from a variety of different sources, whether it's Drupal or say even Word Docs or, or a variety of different applications. Um, we do support dozens of applications on top of Drupal, um, which helps in a lot of organizations because a lot of organizations will have different uh, marketing automation tools or knowledge bases or, or Drupal as a website. Um, we are very proud of the fact that we have a 96% customer retention rate. Um, I think it goes to the fact that we do deal with really great folks like Princess Cruises and, uh, and kind of their vision and, and helping them out and, and providing a solution as opposed to just being a provider. Um, and one thing that they didn't mention is we do have a network of, of professional translators and, and we sometimes tap into that for, for folks like Princess Cruises and in some cases they have their own folks do the, the translations. and. The, the translation management system allows you to pick workflows based on the content type or where the content's coming from. So in some cases, it might be machine translated. In some cases, it might be human translated. It might be our translators as Lingotech, or it might be their translators as you know an in-country marketing manager or someone that's on staff. Um, so the system's highly flexible in, in that um, regards. And so uh, it's fun to see them push the limits and the bounds, bounds on this. Um, you know, we do have an open API that allows you to uh, connect to different systems. Um, so if you have a state of something that needs to be translated that's not Drupal or something else, you know, we can easily kind of hook into that. Um, just next slide. As you know, all, all of our cus uh, all customers are global organizations, um, such as Princess Cruises, and you can see they're supporting, I think, six, seven, and possibly up to 10 languages. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and all of these folks have a significant amount of content that needs to be translated. 
Uh, so the question is, next slide, you know, how, how do you get these dozens of different content authors to help translate this, uh, all of this content? In this particular regards, these guys are really stretching the bounds on this um, because they literally have hundreds of people participating and, and contributing and, and looking at onboard folks, shore folks and whatnot. And all of that content is, uh, is dynamic and is com consistently changing, right? So how do you stay up to this? Um, these guys are using a satellite to keep their data up to date on, on these different, uh, you know, offshore uh, vessels. And so that's, that's pretty neat as well. And so next slide, um, you know, they do need to have this content translated and kind of the old traditional translation method on, on the next slide. And you can just hit go a couple of times and it just draws on here. Uh, the offline pr pr professional translation process just fails, right? You have to have an API driven system. You have to have a dev zone. You can't have manual, blind, obsolete, wasteful. There's all this fragmented stuff. Um, having them have a central repository in their corporate offices allows them to distribute content, you know, globally across all of these different entities and ships. And that makes it uh, makes it more cost efficient for them. Um, you mentioned uh, translation memories. We we store all of the translations, and if the translation comes up again, we don't have to retranslate it because we match it, and we just show you the differences and and go from there. So you go to the next slide and hit a couple things. Um, what happens is is we we enable continuous publishing of this, and of course you have all these different content repositories across human resources, marketing, development, support. And we have this API that can connect all of those pieces together um, into the translation network into LingoTech, and then when done, push back to, to those folks. So next slide, um, just really quickly, Drupal and, and LingoTech, um, we're fully integrated into both D7 and 8. Um, we saw that we have this enabled continuous translation of Drupal content. Um, we can automate and ran, ran trip this content into our TMS, um, and you can see from any location across the globe and then it allows you to track and manage all of this content really easily. I, I just want to call out, I think it's great that you, you're already ahead of the curve with the D8 module, uh, getting that out there quickly. It's awesome to see in our, in our software vendors that help build out our ecosystem, yeah. but they're, they're kind of staying on top of that because especially since it's so API based and definitely yeah. has all this promise of uh, even better web service uh, capability built in progressive decoupling and all the things that uh, Dries has been talking about. Just love to see it, so thank you. Yeah, and we were, you know, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We were, we were actually on release day one. We were, um, we were out, in fact, even in some of the betas, we had a couple of clients that were, uh, we were working with to get the, them on the D8 and the, the multilingual. And folks often ask, you know, because uh, one of the main initiatives for Drupal 8 was multilingual and to make that a better experience. Uh, and D7, as everyone knows, um, you know, has several modules that are dependencies that are outside of core that have to be installed and, and managed. Um, all of that stuff in D8 has been moved into core and is, is maintained as part of the core. Um, we actually think it's better. It's it made it easier for us to program and it uh, makes more sense. The, the, the stuff in there. Um, Gabor, who's you know, in charge of that from the D8 perspective, um, has been a, a, a great leader on that and we appreciate him and all of the stuff that he's done to help drive that that pieces of that and so we're actually really excited about DA because it, it does make our, our our stuff work better and it's a little easier to manage and maintain it before for the end users and one of the things too I, I also like to point out um, you know we deal with a lot of different content management systems and, and Drupal 7 and 8 are one of the best multilingual capable uh, content management systems out there um, simply from the support. I know people will say, well, D7 has all these modules that are dependent on it. Even still, it's, it's a much better system than a lot of other systems. Um, you know, just at a high level, I think, you know, if, if you're deciding to go with multilingual and, and looking for a content management system, Drupal's are, are very good, if not one of the best or better uh, content management systems to, to be out there because of the fact that there's such a, a focus on that in the core and, and in the community itself. Mm -hmm. Just a few steps from our side. We've had uh, we feel really proud of this. Um, you know, launching your um, your module on Drupal.org, and you have one download, and then you have two downloads. Um, and to get a couple of years into this, have fifty two thousand downloads. Uh, we're really proud of the fact that we do have a lot of communities running this. Um, we do offer you know a free version of this that has some limited functionality, but people can certainly get it and try it. Um, if you're running a multilingual site, I would certainly install using our stuff because it automatically in D7 installs all of the dependencies. 
Um, but we do have uh, some interesting ads where we do five APA calls per second, which we feel is quite a bit. We're starting to, you know, as you start to get in, into that, it starts to show the growth of that. We have over 60,000 users on our site, on our, our translation management system. Um, we support 20,000 translation memory vaults, um, which is all of this previously translated content. Um, and that's the cost savings that people have when they can reuse those memories and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, again, we're full, fully supported on eight, and that has been from you know the eight's re, you know initial release date. So, um, super happy to be part of the or, uh, Drupal.org and Drupal organization um, association, and uh, had a really good time at uh, DrupalCon last week, and it was fun to you know catch up with Princess Cruises and other folks, and and uh, really happy about the webinar today. So we appreciate it. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. This has been. Uh one, it's a powerful story. As you said, it's a case study that really highlights the best of Drupal. Um, I, I don't think anyone in the Drupal community has any doubt that the number of sites that need this kind of translation, localization, yeah. uh, web service-based uh, central hub repository model, that's, that's just going to increase as, yeah. as we see more and more companies that are, are really pushing into these global markets and doing these amazing things. And I want to thank you all for your, your time and pulling this together and, and uh, putting it out there. Um, you know, I, I, I want to, we're getting pretty close to time here, but I just want to give a quick second. If there are any questions that people want to pop up in the q and I'm happy to pass those along. Uh, I see one, and actually I, I feel a little bit hesitant asking this one, but uh, it's about price tag. Um, for a project this big, what sort of budget should you set aside? Um, or is that something you're willing to share? It's well, it's a hard question even for us to answer, not for any other reason other than we are internally, uh, we're an internal development team at Princess. So there was no, um, uh, you know, apart from Lingotech and that stuff, you know, all the Drupal development, the uh, um, front end development, all that stuff took place internally. So even if I gave a number, it wouldn't really match, I don't think, you know, what uh, an open market cost would be. Um, and moreover, it's a uh, product that we are building. It's not yeah. an application that we are building. Yeah. Uh, it's an entire platform. So it's a lot more than building a Drupal website. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't think that the number that we even come up with will even closely match building a website of Drupal. Yeah. We've been continuous uh, improvement and really rolling out yeah. uh, features continuously. Uh, going, I'm, I'm assuming some sort of agile process where you're going through sprints and user stories and, and really focusing on the user. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah, well, that's, yeah it, uh, and Hillary is much more involved in this than we are in some ways, but, you know, we release to the ships uh, right now once a week. Uh, we're going to probably move to twice a week. Um, maybe, hopefully we can get to daily. That's where we want to be. So it is, it is yeah, con continuous iteration. We started on the project uh, almost four years ago from the get-go. We were involved um, from, um, you know, collecting all the business requirements, getting the um, user stories all together, doing the first iteration of wireframes through the design, through the creation of it, through actually going to the shipyard and doing the um, physical deployment of it. Sabu and I, between the two of us, have been probably on um, 16, ships. Yeah, 16 ships doing the rollout and training of this. So we're very hands-on and involved in the whole thing from end to end. So yeah, it's like Sabu said, it's hard to, it, it becomes a challenge to kind of put a, uh, a project cost on that um, in a traditional sense. So because uh, I would we never complain about my bandwidth while developing again if you were developing from the ships. Like that, <laughs> no. we're a satellite connection, that, that actually frightens <laughs> people. But yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. It can, be a, it can be an adventure, I'll say that. Yeah. So it's like a concept of completion. We actually do uh, training on board the ships too. So we go to the ship, deploy, train crew members. We have trained like 800, 900 crew members uh, in big theater. So as a team, we do everything end to end from concept you know, to delivering and getting feedback directly from customers. So, so <laughs> that's why I said the range is kind of different or the way we work is kind of different from a traditional uh, project team. Awesome, such a, such a great story. Uh, well, just one last quick reminder, uh, again, DrupalCon Dublin, I, I hope you guys submit this to DrupalCon Dublin. Surely you have a ship nearby that you could, you know, use to get there. Um, Good idea. I like it. I would love to hear the, the story told again. Uh, and uh, also a quick reminder about Dr Dr Global Training Days, which is the next opportunity to engage with the Drupal Association. Um, 
again, thank you everyone. This has been an excellent webcast. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's going to get a, a, a ton of usage out of it and it's uh, telling such an amazing story. So thank you. Thank, thank you everybody. Thank you for yeah, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.